Hello YouTube, welcome back to my channel. Yes, I know once again, it's been ages since I last made a video. I always say I'm gonna do more and then I never actually get around to it. But half of that is down to the fact that I don't wanna make videos for the sake of it and I wanna make sure I'm giving out some relevant information as and when it happens. And that's what I have for you today. So in a couple of days, I'm actually heading to the hospital because I have to have a cardiac catheterization with exercise procedure. Now it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's going to be something very, very similar to an angiogram. So if you've ever known anyone that had to have an angiogram or have a stent put in, which is when you have like blockages around your heart and stuff, it's a very, very similar procedure to that, but it's going to be more related to the fact that I have the clots going on in my lungs and it's an ongoing treatment procedure, which I'm going to get into more now. So since finding out that they wanted to perform this test and me to go through it, I have found it extremely difficult to find a first-hand experience from another patient anywhere online to actually help me understand what is gonna be happening and what to prepare for. I even reached out in a couple of the groups and asked people who might have had this procedure before kind of how it went for them and got very, very minimal response slash just kind of a response that said that they didn't enjoy it, but nothing to actually help me prepare for it and what to expect. So this is why I'm making this video and I'm gonna take you with me throughout the whole procedure because I hope that if someone else is out there in this boat, searching for what it might be like when they have to do this in the future, they can refer to this and then maybe have a bit of peace of mind. So how this all came about was through a follow-up appointment with the hypertension specialist. So if you didn't see the last video that I made, I spoke about meeting with uh, him earlier this year. He confirmed that I had the chronic clots in both of my lungs. It was definitely there. They're not gonna go anywhere on their own. The only way of getting rid of them now is through surgical intervention. He confirmed that I didn't currently have hypertension, which is great. And he also said that the breathlessness that I find that I still have upon exertion, so any type of exercise, um, is probably caused to this, but they need to do this test in order to figure out what is actually going on from the inside. So slight bit of background, I have had a range of tests in the past to actually get to this point. I did one of the regular stress tests that a lot of you have probably heard of before where you go in just for a regular appointment, you know, get all the stickies put all over you and then you have like the breathing thing in your mouth and then you're either on the treadmill or riding a bike um, and then they just measure how the breathing goes and how your heart responds and everything throughout that test. Um, and for me, that all kind of came back pretty normal looking. There was a slight flag to do with the amount of carbon dioxide that I expel, um, but I was getting enough oxygen in. So then they looked at the actual blockages and uh, this was before they knew that I had the chronic clots, but I had a follow-up VQ scan. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, I do have a video on that as well if you want to look at it after this. Um, but the VQ scan showed that I do have a mismatch because the blood was not getting around my lungs. There are some places that are still blocked four years on from my diagnosis, and that is the chronic clots. So after going through a bunch of different testings, a bunch of different doctors, and then eventually being referred to this hypertension specialist, even though I don't have hypertension, um, it's gotten to the point where they run this test that I'm having this week, which is their gold standard to look at the actual pressures inside the pulmonary artery. So I'm just gonna give you the information that I've gotten up to this point as a patient, and then as we work through this video, you're gonna see me actually go, I'm gonna plan on filming on the day where I'm actually in the hospital and giving you kind of a first-hand view of what is going on when all this is happening. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I will try and film as much as I can on the day. Obviously the procedure itself, I won't be uh, in, a, in a state to do that, but um, I do plan on just like documenting throughout the day kind of how I'm feeling and what it was like, just so I can add on to a whole experience in this video. So how the procedure has been outlined to me so far is that they need to get the catheter in the pulmonary artery and there's different entrance points that they generally use for this and it's either the neck, what's known as radial, which is the wrist, or the groin. Most commonly in the past it's always been the groin and I think they still do that a lot if it's just a general angiogram and then they feed a catheter up to your pulmonary artery or heart depending on what you're having done. Um, but for me, I have an exercise portion of this test. So when the catheter is in, I also need to be able to have my legs free to ride a bike. 
and I didn't understand how all that was going to work and to be honest the information that I've been given so far still doesn't outline it. I found one video online that was an Australian um, like doctor's lecture hall uh, where they showed a video of a procedure with that happening and I'm just taking that as an assumption that that's what I'll be having on the day. Um, I'll put some images here so you can see some screen grabs from that video where the exercise bike portion is actually done laying down which no one has said to me at all. I don't know if that's what I'll be experiencing, but I assume that when I am on the bed, having the catheter put through my arm or my neck, whichever they decide on, and then it's in, measuring the pressures, um, I then have to have my legs free and I'll be laying down with my feet going on the exercise bike whilst laying down. Um, so that's what I'm assuming going in at this point. If we scroll forward a bit, hopefully you'll see at the end of this video what the actual experience was and I'll be able to outline that in more details, but this is where I am now, a couple of days before the procedure. So the other information in the prep document that I was sent, um, sent me for blood work. So today, a couple of days before, it said one or two days before you have to go for blood work. Um, that did a whole range of a hem like a hematology profile. I think they were looking at like kidney function, liver function and a few other things. Um, but I guess I'll find out more about that when I go in for the actual appointment. Um, they also took my INR reading um, because if any of you have watched any of my other videos, uh, I'm on warfarin for life. That is the anticoagulant that I've ended up on. So I have to have regular INR checks anyway to see the fluidity of my blood. Um, so that was part of my blood test. My doctor has also said that I continue taking my warfarin throughout this entire process. So there is always a discrepancy between doctors um, when it comes to any procedure for people on blood thinners. I have seen plenty of accounts online where people going for like wisdom teeth surgery and anything have to be have to stop their blood thinners or they're told to stop their blood thinners um, for a short time and then they go back on it once they've healed and things like that. I, between a couple of different doctors, have actually not ever had to stop taking my blood thinners for any procedures and tests that I've had in the last few years. And the same goes for this one. So it says on my preparation document to continue taking my warfarin throughout the entire procedure. So that is part of that as well, but it's definitely a conversation to have with your doctor if you are looking at going into any kind of procedure is to see what they want you to do with your anticoagulants. So some other things to note uh, from the PrEP document that I received around this whole procedure as well um, is that it talks about the preparation and aftercare because you cannot be alone for the first 48 hours once you've had this procedure. I assume because if anything happens to the artery that they have put the catheter in, obviously that could be potentially very detrimental. Um, so they need to make sure that you're with someone and someone who can help you get around. They state on it that you have to be dropped off and picked up by someone. You're not to be kind of getting yourself around. You're not allowed to use public transport. You're not allowed to drive. Um, and this is for the first 48 hours after the procedure. So in my case, I have my husband, which is great, but if you are out there and you need like a friend or a family member to support you through this, then you need to make sure that someone is like staying overnight with you, um, that you're not too far away from the hospital in case something does happen, um, and that you're not going through public transport or anything where I, I think potentially you could either get, you know, knocked into or, you know, have, I don't know, something could happen, um, but they do outrightly state all that on the PrEP document. Um, so it's something to be aware of if that's something that you need to, um, if you don't just have anyone that you currently live with, if you live alone, then you need to think about that. They also state that you can't do any exercise or like heavy lifting for anywhere from four to seven days after the procedure as well. Um, so for me, I've had to take a couple days off work and uh, it falls quite close to the weekend as well. So I've got a bunch of recovery time, um, but it, yeah, you're not allowed to move around too much after it. They state that usually whatever en entrance point they use, like usually if it's the arm or the leg, you're not supposed to bend those very much uh, for the first uh, few days after the procedure. So you need to make sure that you've got stuff at home to prepare for you to be lying down for a good chunk of time um, and things like that and no heavy lifting. It does also discuss um, like fasting. So because it is a surgical procedure, uh, I do have to stop eating three hours before my check-in time and only allow clear fluids up until that point when uh, I go in. So um, it's the same as any other kind of surgical slash medical procedures that you might have. It has those rules on this setup document as well. So I know you should prepare for that. And then just the average stuff of wearing comfy clothes, bringing stuff to entertain yourself whilst you're there, not having an crazy amount of valuables with you and all that usual stuff. 
The other thing about having someone with you to come get you and be with you on the day, um, they do state that after the procedure has happened, you may be kept in from anywhere from four to eight hours after the catheterization because they need to monitor you. They obviously need to see that they haven't had any little nicks in the artery anywhere or there's any internal bleeding or you're having any kind of reaction to anything that could have happened during the uh, procedure. So it is a big chunk of the day. Um, I, my check-in time is kind of mid-morning. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I spend the first hour doing all the prep, you know, getting changed, getting the IVs, answering all the questions that they need, probably doing like heights and weights and blood pressures and all that type of stuff. It probably take another hour or so before the catheterization procedure even happens. I don't know how long the catheterization procedure usually takes, especially because there's the added exercise portion to it as well. Um, but then if there's the waiting around afterwards where you're just sat being monitored from anywhere from four to eight hours, the person that's supporting you needs to be uh, entertained for the day because they cannot be with you that entire time. So um, they do give them notice apparently, but yeah, it's gonna you're going to need to kind of block out a day for just for the procedure um, and then have the recovery day as well. So it is a big chunk of time that you need to make sure that you've got a lot into this. So that is a very rambled rundown of all the information that I have so far and the current state that I'm in at this precise moment. Um, I could do one of those little transitions and say like, I'll see you on the other side. Um, but I'm just gonna say that the next few minutes of this video are gonna be me actually in the hospital, either about to go through it or going through it. And uh, I'll be giving you an update on what it's like to actually go through this from the patient's point of view. So I will cut this one here and I will say, see you on the other side. Well, here I am back here. It's been a couple of days since the procedure. Um, and although I did take a few clips and some pictures and stuff in the hospital, um, there were a lot of other people around and a lot of people were in a not very healthy state at all. So I decided that I didn't want to disturb people by explaining what just happened to me in hospital and by talking into my phone. Um, I'm not a teenager, so uh, I didn't think I wanted to disturb people by doing that. So now I've waited a few days until I'm feeling better at home. And so I'll give you the rundown from here. So before I give you the whole rundown of what just happened, um, yeah, I'm all good. The procedure went absolutely fine. There was no complications. Um, and I've just spent the weekend uh, being bored at home recovering. Um, so let me explain what it's like. So as was planned, I arrived at my appointment time, which was 10.45. Um, I was pretty much took straight in. Um, and then as expected, the first uh, portion of the appointment was me like, getting into the gown. They gave me some fetching hospital socks, um, did all the questions with the nurse. So like the height, the weight, when was my last meal, um, just to check that I'd done the fasting and all that stuff. Um, when I was in the bed, they did an EKG um, just to get some base level readings. Um, they put an IV in my left arm. I think they just do that under precaution in case anything happens during the procedure that you need to have meds administrated for. Um, as I'm female, they took a urine sample just to rule out pregnancy. So obviously if you're male, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then the doctor came in for a very brief chat. Uh, and his chat was basically just a mini explanation of what his intentions were during the procedure. Um, so he was checking the pulses in my arms and just looking at the overall state of my veins um, and said, you know, his uh, intended access point um, was my right wrist. Um, everything had kind of felt good and strong in terms of my pulse. So he wanted to start there. It's a bit less invasive than the neck. Um, but he did say if at some point during the procedure they were getting any resistance or things weren't going as smoothly as he wanted them to, then he would switch up to a neck access point um, during the procedure. Um, but like that likely wasn't going to happen. Um, and then he also gives the usual spiel before any procedure about potential risks and stuff. Um, and in this case, just saying, you know, there's fairly common procedure, um, the exercise portion, portion not too much, um, but overall like a less than 1% risk of mortality from doing this kind of procedure. 
So at this point, it was around 11.20, I clocked as I went into the surgical room. Um, first thing I noticed was just like how insanely bright this room was. Um, like you expect obviously a very clinical setting being a surgical room and you see stuff, you know, on TV or the internet when you're watching things. Um, but this room was so much brighter than anywhere else in the hospital. Um, as I was wheeled in, um, there was a narrow bed in the very middle of the room and I could see like there was a pedal machine um, at the end of the bed where the feet would go and then at the head end there was like a scanner on an arm so it looked like it could move around, it was like a square shape. Um, so that was like the bed layout. Um, so they shimmered me onto that um, and as I said it was, it was kind of narrow and the pedals were at the end so just like the pictures that I provided earlier in the video about that video I saw in Australia um, yeah it was that kind of setup with the pedals right at the very end so for the first portion where you're obviously not needed to be on the pedals um, I was laying down on this narrow bed um, but my legs were bent up um, so I wasn't laying completely flat, obviously my torso upwards was laying down, um, but I had my legs bent and that's how I spent the whole uh, first section of the procedure. Uh, when I got onto the bed, um, another nurse came over and she was like putting all the stickies on me. So if you've like we've spoken about before, if you've had an ECG or another stress test and you have like the little circle sticky pads with a little bit of metal on it where they hook you up to the machines, um, I had those applied. Um, so this was all coming in from the left hand side. Um, so I'm hooked up to a whole bunch of wires and obviously I've got the IV in that arm as well. Uh, meanwhile, another nurse is on my right hand side prepping this arm and uh, she's, she starts uh, washing me with like this pink stuff that they use. Apparently they don't use iodine anymore when it comes to operations, they have this pink stuff. Um, so I was very pink after this operation because um, they just kind of wiped my whole like uh, right hand and the wrist and then my inner elbow as well. So while that nurse is, uh, is doing all that and prepping me on my right hand side, I just start looking around to see what else I can see. And there is this huge monitor that gets wheeled in uh, next to the left hand side of the bed as well. So it's like a giant TV screen um, and it's got all of the readings on me. So at this point, I'm obviously hooked up to the stickies. I've got a heart rate monitor on my left index finger. Um, and uh, it's just got all of my internal readings with like a huge section of the screen dedicated to like a black and gray area, which is what the ultrasound scanner, um, the thing that was at the head end of the bed, um, is gonna show this area of my chest uh, for when the doctor is doing the actual procedure. So he can see where the wires are going when he's poking around in my heart. So once all that stuff was prepped, um, obviously I'm all cleaned down and ready. Uh, hooked up to all the machines and things are all in place then my doctor comes in and he starts doing the procedure so the first thing that happened was um, him saying obviously they're gonna stick to the wrist as planned and they freeze you first so again I think we've all been there or people that haven't been there if you've had any kind of injection you feel that initial sting so he injects me with the freezing stuff in my right wrist um, and then soon after that sting uh, dissipates and you start to not feel much at all. I was very aware of how frozen my right thumb and the and that kind of like thumb muscle area of the hand um, was like it was like very very frozen. Um, it was a very odd feeling. It like went completely numb quite quickly. Um, and then whilst that was kicking in, he puts an IV in my right arm. So now matching IVs right and left. Um, but he also freezes that as well. So he injected me with some freezy stuff. And for some reason, that one, that one I felt, um, I think I was laying on the bed and I went, Whoa. and he just kind of looked at me, he was like, what? I was like, I definitely felt that. And he was like, okay, hopefully that's the last thing that you feel. Um, so uh, yeah, once that kicked in again, yes, I was, uh, I was numb in these areas. Um, and then a whole bunch of prodding and poking around begins after that. So. Yes, you are frozen, but I will say the procedure as a whole isn't really that pleasant. So you you are numb and it's not like it's a painful thing, but anyone that's had this type of stuff before, like, I don't know, I always still feel some sort of like pressure or sensation. Yes, the fact is, is that, you know, you're not hurting or anything like that, but you're still aware that something is going on. So if you're a little bit squeamish, maybe this is like a mini trigger warning, um, but what I felt and how I've described it to like my friends and family is that if you can imagine like a very, very flimsy rubber tube that's wet 
And then if you had another very flimsy rubber tube that you like inserted into that one and then were maneuvering it around, you'd get that kind of squeaky kind of resistance if you were to put rubber on rubber. Um, and that's what it felt like going in and out of my arm for the bulk of this procedure. Like that was the only way I can describe it. And it's like an internal cringe. Um, I definitely know I was laying on the bed at some point, just kind of like making this weird face because yeah, I'm not in pain. I will, I will say that over and over again. It's not like you're laying there just being like, this is killing. It's just weirdly uncomfortable. It's just not a pleasant feeling. It's just a little bit kind of cringy, squeamish style feeling. Um, but you just have to lay there and try and focus on other stuff in the room to take your mind off it. And luckily during this procedure, you have got that giant TV screen, the huge monitor that's right next to you on the kind of way that you're facing because when they start, they obviously cover everything up to keep it completely sterile and they put a screen, it's a see-through screen, but a screen between you, your arm and the doctor. So you can't really see what's going on. It's not like you're gonna watch your arm being messed around with and have all these things prodding in and out. Um, you're kind of at a point where you are mainly fo like facing left, um, even though you're lying flat. Um, so there is a lot of stuff going on in the room for you to not fully focus on the fact that someone is like prodding your arm with this stuff internally. Um, so that's what I did. I was like looking at the monitor a lot because I, I was just curious. I really wanted to see what was going on. And um, because you really don't feel anything, especially like when it when it's in there, um, the, the screen with the ultrasound scanner that's moving around whilst you're on the bed, um, it, you can see that image on the screen of the wires in there. And obviously to us layman's, it just looks like a black and gray screen and you can see like a wire poking around, no idea where it is or what it's doing, but um, it's a very, very clear image. And it's interesting to just like see the doctor do his thing and just like get straight to the points that it needs to be. So other than obviously the, the cringy feeling in, in the arm, um, I will say the other things that I felt with the whole chest area um, is that when the wires are in certain places and um, they start putting wedges in because they want to be able to measure the kind of buildup of blood and the pressure when it fills the right atrium and left atrium and they want to look at the pulmonary artery and they need to get all of their measurements. And for me, when the wires were kind of going in, whether I was looking at the screen or not to kind of attribute this time, um, I felt like the beginnings of like a palpitation. That's what it felt like to me. So if you're like me and you've ever had like a palpitation with the heart, I always get like what kind of feels like a rush kind of filling feeling. Like you, you feel like you're slowly kind of breathing in and waiting for like a huge pump to come. Um, it's hard to describe again, but if you know what I'm, I'm trying to get at, um, if you get heart palpitations at all, that kind of like random nervous feeling and then you like it, it regulates itself. That's what it felt like when the wires were doing their thing. Um, so it wasn't like, again, it wasn't uncomfortable or painful, but it kind of all seemed to sit in this like part of my throat um, where you just, you, you feel like something's just like, something's about to come, like there is like a build up and then you're gonna uh, get back to normal. Um, so that's what it felt like for me. Um, and then they also do a bit with contrast dye. So if you've ever had a CT scan with contrast dye or anything like that, um, you know what that feeling's like. They they pump you with the dye and then you get that like warm rushing feeling and then you kind of feel like you're peeing yourself um and it was exactly the same as when I've had it through an IV for a CT except they were pumping it straight out of the end of the wires in the heart um so you could see the dye on the screen and you could see it go through all your arteries you could see it like flushing itself into your system um and they did this a few times um but it was exactly the same feeling as everything else um you kind of get that weird like warm rushing feeling um it kind of very much sat in the throat I think just because of the position that you're in um, but it quickly spread around the whole body like it usually does and then you get that little feeling like you are peeing yourself too. So the procedure started where they just do a baseline, they're doing their thing, I'm just obviously at rest, I'm lying on the table, they're getting stuff done and he very quickly saw that like my readings they were getting a baseline were completely normal so he was like yep yeah, the exercise portion of the test is warranted. So once they'd got all their baseline readings from the right and the left and the pulmonary artery and all that stuff, um, they then get my feet put onto the pedals and strapped in. Um, obviously still lying down, my top half still hasn't moved, my legs are still up in the air, but now my feet are on those pedals. Um, and then I just start, start getting into a motion and make sure that I'm comfortable. 
To which point they're like, okay, we'll add some resistance. So they put it up to what they call 20 watts. So obviously when I was pedaling, I could start to feel a bit of resistance on the legs. Um, I'm very, very comfortable on a bike. It's what I do. Uh, mountain biking is my hobby as well. I spend the summer doing so. The bike riding portion wasn't kind of uncomfortable for me or out of the ordinary. Like it's very, it's a very fluid motion. Um, so yeah, I just start pedaling. I was keeping a regular pace um, and they, once again, do the procedure. So in and out of the arm, they're poking away, they're doing all their stuff, they're getting their readings. The good thing at this point is that you're so focused on the pedaling that the stuff in the arm just kind of is a complete afterthought. Like you're just thinking like, keep keep it going, um, trying to get the exercise going. You want them to get good readings. You're trying to, you know, build up to a point where like, yes, your heart rate is racing and all that stuff so that they get some real good exercise values. As I was doing quite well, um, I was pedaling for a few minutes and they were like, keep going, keep going if you can, let us know if you need to stop or anything. Um, but I, I was I was feeling okay. I mean, like I have an e-mountain bike, so, and I go on quite big rides, so I, <laughs> I'm kind of used to this sort of feeling. Um, so they doubled the wattage. Um, so he was like, if you feel like you can keep going, we'll do 40 watts. So they put it up to 40 watts. And he was like, okay, keep pedaling for a few minutes. He never really said the time, but I don't think he'd clocked that when I was watching the monitors, I saw that I was kind of, you know, going up to like 10 minutes basically. So by the time they'd done all of the testing at 40 watts, I think I'd been pedaling for just over 10 minutes. Um, so I was at a point where my heart rate was elevated. I saw that it had spiked to like 200 at one point, but my kind of main reading, like average reading was like a heart rate of like 133, I think they put on the results. Um, so I'm at a point where like, yes, they're getting exercise readings. I was like starting to breathe heavily. I was feeling like I was doing exercise. So I did the 40 watts. I'd obviously pedaled for a little over 10 minutes. They've done all of their measurements. They're going in and out of my arm again, getting all the readings, doing the wedges and all that stuff. Um, and then, yeah, once I think I saw the timer get close to 11 minutes and that's when they're like, okay, you can stop pedaling. We'll call it there. We'll do the math on the readings and we'll let you know. Um, but they were just quite impressed with the fact that I could do about pedaling. So there's one thing that comes out of it. So that was the whole procedure. Um, so then at that point, they just start taking me all down off all these, uh, off all these monitors. So they take off all the stickies. Um, they start bandaging me up because um, obviously I've got this wound in my artery that needs to um, have a lot of pressure on it to stop any bleeding. Um, so my IV on the right arm was just bandaged up like normal. Um, and then they put this band on my right wrist, which I'll show you a picture of. Um, and it's basically an air band. So it keeps like tight pressure on the wound um, straight after the procedure. And then as I was wheeled out to the recovery ward where you're held for a while afterwards, um, they slowly like take some C's, like two cc's of air out every kind of, I think it was like, like 20 minutes or half an hour um, until they get to a point where they just fully take it off and then you've just got a regular bandage on, on the wrist. Um, I got back to the recovery ward around about 12.40. So it was around about an hour, a little bit over an hour for the whole thing to happen. Once I was back at recovery, I'm just like laying on the bed, chilling. Um, they give me a sandwich and some juice. Um, hospital food wasn't brilliant considering I hadn't eaten since the night before, but you know, it was food, so I gobbled it down. Um, and then my arm just started to ache, to be honest. Like it was a very, it was like an, a painful ache. Um, not that the freezing had really worn off because my thumb and my hand was still pretty numb. Um, but as a, as a whole, my whole arm was just, it kind of, it felt heavy and painful and achy. Um, and there wasn't really anything I could do to like relieve that. Um, they were very adamant about me not using my wrist. They were like, don't bend your wrist. Um, they're like, you know, you can move your arm around. They were like, but just like, don't put any weight on it. Don't bend it. Um, and I still haven't bent it to this day. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just had to kind of lay there uh, and see it through. Shortly after me getting put back on the ward and having some food and stuff, the doctor came back through. Um, he had like a printout sheet of my results, uh, basically confirmed that um, there were some ev elevated levels with the exercise, but it looked like a pretty normal response. Um, once again, they have completely ruled out pulmonary hypertension. Um, so once again, that's great. But then secondly, it's also not an answer. 
Um, so I don't, I don't want to be diagnosed with hypertension at all, but I'm in that cycle of like something's not right, but all the tests come back normal. And I know I see that a lot when it comes to people with chronic illnesses and stuff. It's just like you're forever presenting with symptoms and you get every test under the sun and then people always just tell you that you're fine when it's like clearly there's still something wrong. Luckily, in my case, my doctor is very aware that it's not a completely healthy state. Um, which is why he did his referral to the specialists in Toronto that look at the removal of chronic blood clots because he's like, the blockage there is causing something. Um, and even though it's not warranted to be like, you're completely in the unhealthy range and you don't have hypertension and stuff like that, it's like, it doesn't mean that the clot shouldn't be removed. So all of that and these numbers and everything are gonna be fed further into his referral. Um, and then hopefully I hear what their opinion is pretty soon. So once he left, uh, the nurses came along and they basically said that my checkout time would be in around two, two and a half hours. So even though the uh, guidance said you can be kept any, in from anywhere from four to eight hours, I think that's obviously if you have like a, a groin entry point or maybe a neck entry point, just because they're areas where you have to be completely flat and not move around at all. Um, whereas an arm entry point is obviously one of the easier ones to help to recover from. So yeah, I was gonna be laying around for a good two and a half to three hours after the procedure. Um, I'll put some pictures up of what my arm looked like. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I just laid there with this kind of achy arm um, and they did give me some Tylenol um, to help with that. They uh, made me wander around for like a minute or two just to see how I was walking around, maybe after like an hour or two of being in recovery just to like check how I was um, and that was all fine. Um, the entire time that I was in recovery, I had like the blood pressure cuff on my left arm and that was taking readings every, I wanna say like 15 minutes, it was pretty often, um, just to kind of keep an eye on how everything was going there. Um, and then the nurse just went through the recovery sheet with me. So it was basically leaving the bandages on for a day or two um, before I then take them off and kind of clean them. Um, obviously that was today, I had a shower this morning cause I did not look this fluffy when I woke up today. Um, so I'm feeling pretty clean right now. Um, but other than that, it was just like not to bend the wrist, basically treat it like it's broken for the first kind of four or five days, uh, not pick up anything that's heavier than like 10 pounds or so. Um, and just rest it out. Um, is pretty much the only guidance they can give you. Um, and then obviously if I were to notice any bleeding or if I were to have any severe pain or if I were to notice that I was getting any lumps around the access point, then with bleeding, I had to hold, have to hold pressure on it for a good 10 to 15 minutes and then see if it stops. Um, but if anything else happens or if it does continue to bleed, then I need to go back to an emergency room to get looked at. And that was basically it. So if you are headed in for one of these procedures, I hope that was like an in-depth um, explanation from a patient's point of view. Um, obviously I'm not gonna go crazy in depth with like all of the measurements they were taking and the different procedures they were doing in the middle because to me it was just a black and gray mess with some wires on the screen. So if you do have any questions or if you think I might have missed anything and you wanna know anything else about what might, you might have to expect, then obviously leave a comment and I try and get back to anyone that leaves a, leaves a comment. Um, and also let me know if this was helpful at all or if you experienced anything different because this is just my one person point of view from something happening in Vancouver. Um, but obviously it might change depending on where you are in the world and you might have had different experiences which is always good to know for any possible future event. So yeah, I'm going to go back to my uh, bored state on the sofa and continue um, not bending my wrist and just uh, hopefully... Uh, get back to a bit of a normal state after the next couple of days of rest as well. Thanks for sticking it out this far and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.